greetings to everyone who's who's out there. Um, <clears throat> my name is Tom, Tom Dannett. I'm the, the CEO and also the founder of, of Street Child. And um, yeah, thank you so much to everyone for, for taking time to, to come and listen to this, our final webinar of, of 2020. Um, yeah, webinars have been a thing in the background of our lives for, for a couple of years, but, but um, have come to the foreground in 2020 in ways that we could not have predicted um and uh yeah i think at street Chub we've we've been so um you know we've done one of these most most months a, a couple uh, in some months and um we've actually just found it a real privilege to to correct to have this opportunity to to speak to our our supporters um, and anyone interested in the organization's work and, and really open ourselves up this way and we've been yeah so thrilled that people continue to want to come and, 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 and listen to us. So um, thank you. I'm here with, with just one of my senior colleagues today, uh, Ramya Madhavan. Uh, Ramya is, has been double hatting as our director of our Asia programs. Ramya, Ramya really um, developed our Asia program over the last five years. Um, over the last couple of years, as our you know, wider global programming has, has built up, has focused more and more um, on a head of education brief and we've recently recruited um, a, a new head of Asia um, to, to carry forward the Asia programs um, specifically and Ramya will be focusing on her, her head of education work. Um, so Ramya and I are, are here today and, and really we're going to start with we've got five or six slides that we're going to kind of talk to to um, as our sort of way in to, to giving you a feel for, for what you feel street child has has achieved and the way we've navigated our way through 2020. Uh, what does problem problem led mean for Street Child? Problem led means that we focus on the situation we see before us and we design our response from that point, which sounds basic and obvious, but it, it's a guiding principle for Street Child in, in all of our programs, <clears throat> and we do notice that this is something distinctive about our approach. Um, we notice that, that a preferred approach of many other organizations is to have a, a design, a, a preferred set of methods um, or, or program which one looks to, to bring to situations and, 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 and deliver. There are many positives to that approach. Um, however, we prioritize being, being problem-led um, at Street Child and then designing the program upwards. And this has been a, a cornerstone of, of, of our success over the last 12 years. And I think never before have we seen that the power of, of this, this problem led, which is closely related to agility, one of the other slides, which is, which is coming up. Um, because the situation we found ourselves in this year could not, could not have been envisaged. It needed a, a quick response. Um, we had big plans for, 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 for this year. In January, we spent um, uh, wrapping up a, a fundraising appeal, um, all funds matched by, 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 by the British government. And the, se the second week of January got to the point where it raised just under two million pounds. Um, that was matched up to, to, to just under four million pounds, um, a fantastic boost to, boost to the year. Half that money was going towards our longstanding programs in Sierra Leone. The other half was going to feed into different parts of the organizations for which we had big plans. Personally, I was um, uh, on the road in, 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 in Nairobi, um, planning a, a collaboration with an organization called Africa Education Trust, which resulted in a merger in, in November. We had hoped it would be much earlier. Um, I was then down in Mozambique, um, where we were planning to scale up um, our response to affected communities in the north of Mozambique from the, the, the weather events in, in 2019, the, the cyclone, um, Idai and, and, and Hurricane Kenneth. Um, and I was also in, in, in Nigeria, um, where we have developed our largest body of work over the last three, four years, responding to the Boko Haram crisis. And I was working with the teams on how we were going to, um, to, to scale that up. Um, frankly, by, by then it was, it was, we were in the sort of first, second week of March, and it was clear that the dynamics were changing very, very quickly. Um, the plans we had at that stage changed on a dime, like they did for the, for, for, for the whole world. And 
by the time you, you found us in the, in the first week of April, we were busy. Um, we pivoted you know, 180 degrees towards how we were going to help communities to protect themselves from COVID as number one. All those other ideas that, you know, as we completed those fundraising campaigns, and we let, and started you know, doing those trips I, I mentioned, laying out the plan for the year, just went to, to, to one side. Um, and we focused on the problem of how were we going to protect our communities from from, from COVID and how we could help our communities through um, COVID. We knew we had a lot of experience from from, from Ebola in West Africa, um, and the insight which really drove drove me um, was the, the the stitch in, in time saves saves nine. Um, I just remembered communities that I had um, that, that I visited in Sierra Leone in 2014 and 2015. Um, who had not received the basic messages about what Ebola, Ebola was, um, not taken the basic steps to prevent themselves and had, and had experienced catastrophe. Um, and so what really drove our work um, in, in April, May and June um, was a response to this new problem of COVID coming along. And you know, we are not a health promotion agency, but the biggest problem that we saw um, uh, was, was the threat of COVID uh, ravaging our communities. And so we put all of our usual work to one side, remember those lessons from, from 2014, 2015, and put those into, into, into practice across our, our, our partner network. And because we have this, this orientation um, towards solving problems, the organization did this swiftly and, and, and effectively. And Ram, you, you might want to give a, a couple of comments yeah. on this as well. Sure. And I, I think, Tom, really, you, you touched on a point there about how we weren't a health we weren't a health response organization. And so we really sort of saw two choices, I suppose, in front of us in the kind of March, April, early days. And one was to sit back and say, well, what are other education providers doing or protection providers doing as we try and navigate what's changed in this situation with schools closing down 1.6 billion children out of school? And how do we start to plan and go forward? But really for us, it was what's the problem now and what do we need to be doing to serve our children and our communities here and now? So some of you will have been part of um, some of our earlier webinars back in April and May, where we set out to assess that problem with a rapid assessment that involved 12,100 respondents across 13 countries that we operate in. And for us, that really was the start of saying, well, the need is information. The need is to be able to get in to help communities be prepared to plan to take this on if it if it strikes but mostly to prevent the infection from reaching them and again Tom touched a little bit on how um, so much of that approach was informed by the early days experience in Ebola where a lot of communities were saying if only we'd known this was going to happen a little bit earlier if only the information had reached us all the way where we were we would be so much better prepared to have prevented this from really gripping our communities and so we were able to really leverage our position, both in terms of where we were already working in very hard to reach remote rural parts of the countries that we work in, but much more critically, really leverage our ever expanding partnership networks to start to go out into parts of the countries that we hadn't necessarily even been in prior to then spread the message of COVID, start providing supplies, providing services, building infrastructure like Um, hand washing facilities, providing soap, buckets, masks to communities, and more than anything, educating them on what to expect should the infection, God forbid, eventually reach their community. And whilst it's impossible to know for certain what impact this has had, um, and of course, as the world kind of continues to grapple with that question, we do see that by and large, some of these countries have been able to escape the worst of, of what we're seeing in some other parts of the world. And a large part of that is the collaborative effort, and we were absolutely proud to be part of that, to be able to get that message out and do this kind of prevention and preparedness work very quickly. For us, really, that is the core of what it means to be problem-led and to not necessarily say, this is what we know how to do, but much more to say what needs to be done and how do we build the skill sets and the assets and the networks and the resources, mobilize the resources to be able to get out and do that Of course, this this then comes on to the the second piece for us, which is really about being agile in how we operate. 
And over the years, I think, having had the privilege of working with Street Child for about five years, I'd say that definition of agility has slowly started to shift or diversify. So whilst initially that was really about a small team of people with, I think, very audacious dreams about what we thought was possible, getting out into communities on the road, vehicles being stuck in mud all the time to try and deliver services in really hard to reach areas, more and more and more, this has been about building out our partner networks, really investing in local organizations. Um, and we'll, we'll come to touch on this in a bit more depth later in this conversation. But through the course of April, May, June, July, our partner network expanded from around 42 partners to well over 90 partners. Um, and this was really key to our ability to activate and be agile and to get into some of these very hard to reach areas, particularly because the humanitarian sector was dealing with a problem that we'd never faced before, which was that COVID had really affected industrialized nations. And so travel had come to a stop. We couldn't just parachute into any of these communities to try and support like we perhaps previously could. And this is where one of the points we really want to be able to bring out today is the extent to which Street Child's been uniquely built for a challenge like this. And I think we sometimes have gone between through the course of this year saying, this has of course been really unprecedented because it's been a global pandemic. And so operationally in particular, we've had to think in ways that we've not necessarily had to think before. But when we think about the way that we do our programming work, so much of what we've been able to do this year has built on the kind of distinctive and unique competencies that we've built up right from the early days of Ebola in Sierra Leone and Liberia to more and more the kind of work that we've done in extremely fragile conflict or crisis affected contexts across Asia and Africa. And that agility ultimately was what put us in a really good position, uh, both to be able to respond at a large scale to the COVID crisis itself through the prevention preparedness work, as well as to then slowly start to think about how we would rapidly pivot our existing programs to start to respond to the crisis and the impact that it was happening, whether on schools, whether on families and communities and their livelihoods, whether on economies and entire markets, we had to then go we, we had to really think about repurposing everything we were doing to respond to all of those um, multiple multi-dimensional changes. But again, because we were used to being agile, it was somewhat in our nature, I think, to be able to do that work reasonably quickly. Tom, I'm gonna to throw it back to you for some comments on the agility piece, and then I'll pick up from you on LML. Yeah, no, Rama, I think you've, you've really covered it all on, um, on, on agility. Um, I mean, being before I was talking about being being problem led. I think an organisation uh, which can go from uh, at the in the last week of February, um, it's being focused on education in 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 emergencies to by the first week of um, of April being focused on uh, pandemic prevention um, is, is in, in a very meaningful way um, is. Yeah, it is at the highest level um, indication of, of organizational agility and again an attribute that we've, we've fostered in the organization um, from the beginning a another attribute that we've that we've that we fostered um, is a real seriousness around low-cost solutions um, which you know again a, a bit like being sort of problem-led sort of doesn't necessarily sort of um, uh, make the heart sink um, the same way that a neat, beautiful model um, uh, can be a more attractive and easier topic to talk about than, oh, we look at a problem, we see what we can do. Um, low cost has a sort of, yeah, okay, who wants to go for, for a low cost meal? Um, but we're engaging the realities of our situation. Um, switch our focuses in um, the world's toughest places. Uh, affected by disasters and, 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 and acute development situations where the reality is tiny envelopes, um, vast levels of, of, of need, our usual core issue um, being education, um, you know, underachievement or, or, or lack of access. Um, and you know, actually, you know, again, right at the start of the year, um, or this time last year, the results from the, the, the Liberia um, randomized control trial um, of our three-year involvement in the, the, the LEAP program came out 
our performance was put in the, the, the top bracket against multiple indicators, learning outcomes, um, children's safety at school, um, teacher retention. That was good. But the fact that the, the fact that really made Street Child's, you know, sort of heart, um, yes, well, with pride, really, um, was the economics um, when it was shown that we had achieved these comparable results um, with other high performing organizations by spending between one third and one seventh of the per head cost. Um, so this is our ethos. Um, we, we look to stretch the money as far, we look to, div- to, to deliver meaningful outcomes at an affordable cost. And we took the same approach right through to our, um, to, to, to our uh, COVID response. Um, as we said, you in the period from April through till uh, June, we were predominantly focused on raising awareness around what COVID was, the simple steps that um, communities could take to reduce their risk of getting COVID. And again, we had to focus on the most cost-effective measures, the low-hanging fruit. Um, we funded this 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 response in in, in three ways. Uh, we had our appeal out to our to to, to our UK supporters. Um, our global supporters, predominantly in, in, in the UK, um, who generously, despite the fact we'd only had another appeal, you know, finishing in January, um, entrusted us with just over over four hundred thousand pounds. In addition, um, a number of our core institutional funders um, gave us specific additional COVID response grants, totaling another one point two million pounds. And then we were able to re-nose as many of our existing pre-planned programs as as, as possible. Um, in that period, from um, from, from April to June, we reached with basic COVID um, prevention messaging or services uh, in the region of, of 5 million people um, for a, an expenditure, um, which says an additional expenditure of, of, of less than 1.6 um, million pounds. Um, we were stretching ourselves to reach people as cost effectively as possible. Um, and it's something that we're that we're proud of, and, and I'm going to pass back to to, to Ramia to talk a little bit about um, another aspect of that. Indeed. So I'm actually going to go back a little bit to um, Tom touching on the uh, Liberian Education Advancement Program and the the RCT results that came out earlier in the year. And really, I think when when we said before that we felt in retrospect that we were uniquely built for this challenge, I think this was a a very illustrative example where the government envelope for this this particular program was set at $50 per child. And at the end of three years, we went in challenging ourselves that we would not in fact invest above that because we felt it was so critical that at the end of the program, we were able to hand over an approach that would function within that envelope. We could have invested over and above it as many of the other providers did choose to, but we felt that that wouldn't lead us to the most sustainable transition, which was what we were looking for from the outset. At the end of year three, when the the, the overall evaluation report came out, that of the top three providers, one of them had spent approximately $660 per child. We had started at $50 per child and brought it down to $37 per child in the course of the three years, but had achieved not just equal, but in fact, better outcomes with no unintended harmful impacts. And I I really hang on this point because I think it's really important to us, not only that we are low cost, but that we are low cost for high impact, right? And that being low cost does not in any way imply being cheap or perhaps robbing marginalized populations of what they absolutely and truly deserve. It is being able to deliver those rights and restore those rights at a cost that is ultimately sustainable and ultimately then makes it possible for more and more and more children and communities to be able to avail of that as well. And so that's why we hold this principle really close, not just because we think it makes us competitive as an organization, but truly because we believe that this is the best way to be able to reach the enormously growing number of children and communities in need across the world at the moment. 
This was one of the key principles for us that then started to inform our thinking about how we would pivot our educational programming as it became more and more apparent to us that COVID wasn't going to be something as perhaps some of us had, had hoped in February or March that made an appearance for a couple of months and then went on its merry way. And as we started to realize along with all our, our partners and supporters that this was going to be here to stay for a while, we started to think about what we would do to continue supporting children who were now out of school as a result of these school closures. Again, this was a problem that we dealt with before in Ebola, where schools had been closed for nine plus months across Sierra Leone and Liberia. And what we recognized and knew from that experience that there would be other actors who would get into line to provide alternative learning services. So we saw, for example, in a number of the governments, a uh, number of the countries that we worked in, that governments sprung into action where they could in countries like Kenya, for example, providing TV and radio learning. We saw that there were other actors who were very focused on online learning. I'm sure many of you with children had the the pleasure and the challenge of educating your own children at home um, through the course of the last uh, eight or nine months. Um, so there was a lot of conversation happening about digital forms of learning in some of the lower resource contexts that we work in. There was a lot of conversation that was happening about more analog forms of learning using mobile phones or using radio and television. What we really wanted to do and focus our efforts on was really what we call the bottom of the pyramid. So children from whom digital learning is just simply out of the question, but also children from whom mobile phones aren't an option because there's no cellular network or even where there is, there's not sufficient connectivity or there's not an ability to purchase credit on a regular basis. And for children whom we did a study in Nepal earlier in the year that showed us that in our communities, radio prevalence was less than 10%. And so there was no question of being able to access radio programs being delivered by other actors. So what we did is really focus our efforts on designing a low cost, very simple and scalable solution for children for whom none of these options were going to be viable now or in the near future. And it really focused on using a combination of recorded instruction and home learning packages um, that would be dropped off in children's communities for them to then work on independently. One thing that I'd really like to bring out here that's really critical to how we think about things in both a holistic and an intersectoral and intersectional way was that we wanted to make sure that this solution wouldn't just work for children who didn't have access from a, from a connectivity or a communications or a cost perspective, but that it was able to work with children for, for example, who didn't have access to a caregiver. It was able to work for children who could not in fact read a single letter of the alphabet, either because, for example, they were South Sudanese refugees in Uganda and therefore hadn't learned English yet, um, or because they were perhaps children with certain sensory impairments or mobility impairments. We wanted to make sure that this was going to be a solution that worked for every single child that was out of school. So our last mile learning package really uses a combination of fun games, very interactive sequences, builds in quite a lot of protection information, including COVID-19 preparedness information. I think I've translated uh, songs into at least songs about hand washing into about 16 different languages with our education managers over the course of the last couple of months, but really focused on getting what we call life-saving, life-saving information and learning out to children. And we really know from our experience in other crisis and conflict that learning in these contexts is in fact life-saving and life-sustaining. So a child who has no access to other information or caregivers or stable adults, knowing to wash their hands, knowing to maintain distance from the others that they see around them, could have literally prevented them from catching the disease. We know that the ability to pursue when your world is crumbling around you, and in many of these cases, COVID is only one of a number of crises and issues that these children are dealing with, the ability to sit down every day, play games, experience a stable and secure routine has an enormous psychosocial effect on the cognitive and non-cognitive development of the child. And these were really the things we were focused on as a child-centered organization. We wanted to make sure that every child would make it out of this situation at a bare minimum, having survived and then ready to actually go back in and reintegrate into schools when open. 
We also see now that there is a tremendous window of opportunity, not just to support the kids who were out of school as a result of COVID to go back to school, but actually through this kind of methodology, reach out to millions and millions of children who were already out of school and support them to go back into school as well. And to really leverage what we call this window of opportunity to make a massive difference to children all over the world, both with this approach and with the kind of shared commitment that we see building um, with our supporters and our networks at this moment. Absolutely key to that, as we've now touched on two, three, four times, is our local partner network. And I'm going to throw back to Tom to talk us through how we've advanced that thinking and our approach over the last year. Thanks, Ram. Just before I, I do that, um, just to talk us through the, so the costs of the, um, of the LML program. Of course. So LML has been, of course, in the initial setup, um, it, has, it has averaged somewhere around the $20 mark. But we found that as we achieved economies of scale, and the economies, economies of scale are very, very quick to achieve, because once you've recorded instruction for one child, it costs next to nothing to use that same recording for thousands and thousands and thousands of children. And so very quickly, two to three months in, we were seeing a cost of about a dollar per child per month. So this was a dollar per child per month to enjoy somewhere between three to five hours of instructional support day in and day out, packaged up with, of course, the ability for us to be able to continually monitor and therefore um, sort of tailor and target support for students who needed it even more, which I think is, is an amazing cost and one that we intend to continue building on to see where else we can achieve savings in order to, as we said before, be able to reach more and more children as fast as possible. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that if we can provide a, a meaningful uh, level of, of, of learning and the other benefits you described for children in the most cut off tough context for, for a dollar a month, and that's um, building, that's, I know that's built on principles that we've been developing over the years, but again, kind of COVID has forced us to, forced our thinking on the issue. Um, yeah, that, that is incredibly exciting for this, this COVID era, but as you say, um, you know, be, beyond as well. Um, and yeah, I think something we can be really proud of and excited by. Localized is, is, is the slide that, uh, that, that's before me now. And this is really one of Street Child's most foundational principles. You know, from the very beginning of, 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 of Street Child back in 2008, um, Street Child, the UK charity, existed to support Street Child of Sierra Leone, the, um, the very Sierra Leonean charity. And I say very Sierra Leonean with its, with its own management team, with its own board of directors, an entirely separate entity. And we conceptualized our relationship um, as, um, as, as one of, of different players on the pitch. Um, my job um, and Sweet Child UK's job uh, was to, to generate the funds um, and to provide program support. And Sweet Child Sierra Leone's job um, was, to, was to go forwards and, 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 deliver, and deliver programs using the local knowledge, local skills, local passion. Um, and as Street Child has, has evolved the first four or five years of, of Street Child with Justin Sierra Leone, scaling up that relationship between Street Child UK and Street Child of Sierra Leone. And then in the last five years, um, since the Ebola crisis, when we sought to move, um, move globally and particularly in humanitarian uh, situations, we've carried the, the, um, the, the lessons we learned um, from that, that partnership between Street Child UK and Street Child of, 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 of Sierra Leone um, forwards and really sought to identify local organizations with unique access, unique passion, unique capabilities, and just get behind them. And as, as we've spanned out um, as, as Street Child UK, um, obviously our, our knowledge is built as we move in more contexts, our technical skills are built and we've built a, 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 a team, um, and we'll be able to apply those in addition to our ability to, to to provide funds and to help those local organizations raise, raise funds. Um, this is an approach which is already being strongly endorsed, um, you know, particularly since 2016, the World Humanitarian Summit realized that um, the international humanitarian system needed to do a lot more 
um, to 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 support local organisations to give them space to to lead. Um, and Sweet Child's approach um, has been has been recognised as being one which um, is is in tune and in line, and it's one of the reasons why we have gone forwards. And then then COVID came along, and the whole piece goes to another level because you you can't have loads of international staff moving around. No one can move around. Everyone's got to got to, got to stay at home. And and the the power of local organisations, the essential, the necessity of local organisations came to the fore. Um, and um, for for a lot for, for for a lot of um, international charities, this was you know, required a massive pivot and, and credit to, to those that, that that did. For Street Child, this was more this more of a case of accelerating and, and pressing down harder on our um, on, on our, our pre existing trend. And as Rami has said, you know February, March time, we were working with around 40 organizations um, in the uh, 10 or 11 main countries that we we, we operate in. And as I speak now, um, I, I think it's, it's pretty close to 100 local organizations that we have had a meaningful interaction interaction with, where we've delivered a program together, whether we've supported them to apply for funding um, or something else um, significant. And, um, and it, it's been critical to, the, to our ability to to make an impact and support um, communities which are beyond the reach of, of, of classic international led humanitarian action. Rami, did you want to add anything to that or? Yeah, I think, you know, the, 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 the localization space is a complex one and it's one that as Tom said, we're all grappling with more and more. What I think has been really powerful from our perspective is not just to be able to leverage, you know, as we said a couple of times, the, the access and the, the, the community ties and the trust and the depth of contextualized knowledge that our partners bring, but it's also the, the privilege of having been able to access our global networks, our global resources, to be able to direct them towards local organizations in ways that otherwise perhaps wouldn't have been possible or certainly wouldn't have been possible within the same rapid time frame. Um, so some of the very significant steps we've been able to take in the last couple of months have been activating partners. So partners who've been, for example, in Cameroon, a network of partners who were very eager to respond and just simply weren't able to mobilize the resources to um, we were able to very quickly grant rapid response funds to these partners to be able to get out and start responding, which then helped pique the interest of larger donor agencies, whether the UN or other large um, multilateral networks, who then started to invest in scaling up some of those pilots. So I think for a long time, our thinking has really been about how, how can we be a catalyst, right? And there are some agencies, I think, and, and rightly so, who want to go in and kind of get stuck into a context and do as much as possible. For us, it's really how can we do as much as possible, but really in the tightest and leanest and most catalytic ways to then be able to mobilize, convene, leverage what else is in that context where we can then take our energy and resources to the next context that is in need. And I say context quite loosely, that might mean the next community down the road, the next school, the next child or the next country. And so the, the power of being able to be that network, be that convener and direct the resources to those organizations and increasingly what we are working on what we call reverse prime arrangements where we don't in fact, as, as many organizations typically might, necessarily take the funding and then disperse them to the organizations. We in fact direct the funding to the organizations by connecting up the donor and the local organization and then play a background supporting sort of management monitoring support role, um, really allowing the partner and enabling and hopefully supporting and strengthening them to be on the front foot. Um, and really for their aspirations and aims and understanding of the communities and context to be what lead our approaches rather than the other way around. And this is what we increasingly think the future of humanitarian action and development look like. And to this end, I think, if I were to really sum up, and I hope Tom agrees, what 2020 has been about, it's really about this principle of total impact. And I think now more than ever, 
we recognize the extent to which the world is interconnected, right? And we saw this in a very negative way when we realized that we were so interconnected, we were able to spread, a, spread an infectious disease like wildfire, but with a positive spin on it, we recognize more and more that to be able to do what we want to do, to be able to reach all the children that need our support, we will increasingly have to work in ways that one, leverage this fantastic ever expanding network of partners, but also two, look to influence in ways that allow us to help others adopt some of these approaches and indeed to be able to learn from others in a far more accelerated fashion. So what we've really started to focus some of our energies on in the last couple of months in particular is starting to share some of these success strategies with large global agencies like the Global Education Cluster, the Global Protection Cluster, um, Education Cannot Wait, who are the largest um, education and emergencies fund who are now reaching out to us to say, we recognize you have been doing localization for a long time. And in fact, we have a network of partners who are more and more eager um, to move in this direction. And so what can you help us with or teach us and what can we learn? And we of course have then seen that as a learning experience for us as well in terms of the most effective, efficient ways to deploy resources to be able to reach as many children as possible as fast as possible. It really, I think for us more and more, is not about growing our organization, it's about growing our impact. Um, we don't think there's time to wait to grow ourselves to be able to get out to all the children who need it. We absolutely must look to enable and empower others to do great work and to use that, that relationship to re reinforce what we're doing and to make it better and better. And I think this is what we hold very close in our hearts as we go into 2021. Knowing that the COVID-19 crisis challenge exists, but knowing that that's one of many, many, many compounded challenges that our communities and our children face and will continue to face. We have already in this year, on top of COVID, seen multiple floods. Um, we've seen conflict. We've seen attacks on schools. Um, we've had in Afghanistan, which is a program I, I work closely with, we've seen the Taliban burn down our books on the way to communities. And these are all very real, immediate, everyday issues we've had to deal with. But this time with this added dimension of how do we get around COVID and, and the enormous challenge that that has seeped into everything else that we handle. And so more than ever, I think we rely on our networks of partners, of supporters, of friends in, in the countries that we work in who have this shared vision for children and to be able to go forward working with them to reach more children. Um, I'll hand back to Tom to then talk a little bit more about what 2021 holds for us. Yeah, thanks so much, Ramia. Yeah. Um, I, I wanna hang on, on, on Total Impact, I wanna hang on Total Impact as the, um, as the, the, um, the, the natural corollary, corollary of, of being problem-led um, uh, and, and I want to hang on the idea that yeah our organization doesn't matter um, uh, it's, it's facilitating the outcome that matters um, when we look at a situation I mean when I, when I first moved to um, you know to I first went to, to, to Sierra Leone um, and encountered the situation of, of children on the street. We studied that situation and decided what was the the, 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 the way forwards. Um, I was not concerned about building an organization. Um, I just wanted to make the biggest impact um, on that situation as, as, as possible. Um, it's turned out that building an organization is part of the solution. But um, as we go forward, absolutely, as, as, as Ramya says, um, sharing with other organizations, listening to other organizations, um, contributing to advocacy is absolutely going to be one of the main ways that we can, that we can make a difference, as well as activating um, our partner networks to reach corners um, through through direct service, service delivery. Um, 2021, you know, we, we look down the track. Um, as you sit in the West, I think we can be, we can see a shape of the year. We, we can see a first half of the year, which will still be significantly impacted by, by, by COVID. Um, 
but we have the hope of, of, of vaccines and then we reach the summer in the north um, and then we have a strong um, expectation that the second part of the year um, will be much closer to, to normal. Um, that's important to observe from a, a fundraising perspective. Um, you know, it's something that we haven't haven't touched on in in, um, in in this presentation so far. Is so many of the things we'd usually do to, to engage with our supporters and to generate funds have not been possible. Um, bike rides, marathons, galas, um, and that has you know had a very significant impact. Um, we look forward to to so much of that becoming possible. Um, particularly in the second part of, of, of next year. Um, unfortunately, that same sort of vaccine-led positive um, outlook for, for the second part of next year, next year is not possible for the, or much less possible for, for, for the country which our works in, which will almost certainly be the last um, in the line for, for, for vaccine. So we programmatically, we, we look at, at 2021, with a lot of lingering uncertainty around COVID. But again, as, as, as Ramya says, COVID is, is in reality an extra layer on the problems that are all being, already being faced. Um, and in many cases, it's far from the largest layer. Um, they're already being placed in, in the situations that, that Sweet, Child, Sweet Child move in. So we will continue to be flexible. Um, we'll continue to look at situations freshly and determine what the best path is. I think the last mile learning strategy will remain very relevant um, so wider developments we've, we've mentioned um, Cameroon, which I started moving in Cameroon earlier this year um, and, and actually by, by supporting partners through COVID has, has developed a more advanced position um, a, a partner network that we now have knowledge and trust in each other um, and we're delighted by that because um, the situation initially drew us to Cameroon was of course nothing to do with COVID it was the Anglophone crisis where you've got um, yeah, one of the world's I would say sort of nastiest least known crises, um, uh, a, um, a conflict, a political and, 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 and physical conflict between uh, the Anglophone and, and the majority Francophone population. Uh, one of the results which has been children at a school um, uh, in many cases for around um, three or four years. Um, that is a situation that the Sweet Child wants to, want, wants to move in. And over the course of this year, we've developed a far stronger muscle to, to move in that situation. Similarly, in, in, in Mozambique, we initially went there to respond to um, the longer term rebuilding after the, um, the, the, the extreme weather in 2019. Um, actually, that area has been overrun by um, an increasingly high profile um, Islamist uh, type insurgency. And um, because of the relationships we've built over the course of this year, the partner network we've developed there with an increasingly strong position to make a difference for for children there. So we will continue to push new boundaries um, in 2021 in places like Cameroon and, and Mozambique. Um, we're incredibly excited about starting to work with AET, uh, Africa Education Trust, who I mentioned um, we've been talking to for almost two years now. Um, and we were close to finalizing a merger in, in, in February before COVID um, came in um, and yeah, consumed our attentions and we were delighted to complete that that, that, um, that merger of AET into Street Child in, in November. Uh, AET was a strong program for footprint in Uganda and Kenya, but really unique and fantastic programs in, in Somalia and, and, and South Sudan. Um, we know that over the course of this year, we've, we've had to respond to COVID. We've also just tried to progress the organization's core goals of, of strengthening our ability to to be there for children who, who, aren't, who aren't receiving a safety education that, that they deserve. And I really see us continuing down these trends in, in, in 20, 2021 in a not too planned fashion, because we're just going to have to see how, how the situation evolves before us. And hopefully one of the themes you've got out from this presentation um, is the, uh, the, the agility that the problem orientation of, of Street Child's approach. Um, Ramya, we spent um, time reflecting on the ingredients of why we feel Street Child has been impactful um, and successful over the course of, of this year. Um, do you, what regrets um, do we have? What things in hindsight do we feel that actually we might have done, done better? Mm -hmm. 
I think I think when you work in this sector, there are often more regrets always than there are successes, just because the need is so great. So I, I will struggle to kind of say what's the greatest regret, but let me list a couple. Um, I do think potentially in, in the early days, it was, it was difficult to understand exactly what we should be doing. Um, and I think partly that was because no one knew how long this was gonna go for. So it was, should we just kind of continue on business usual as usual and think this is going to be a, a sort of one month break um, while we do some other stuff? Or is this really going to fundamentally change the way that we do things? Um, and as always, I think with the power of hindsight, could we have done that quicker? Could we have done that um, with a bit of a little bit more foresight, perhaps always? And I'm sure everybody feels that way uh, when we look back on the course of this year. Um, the second thing, probably, and I, I don't know that I call it a regret, but really something that I think increasingly I would love to see us focus on as an organization is what has always been really core to our work is the focus on the most marginalized and our ability to really go in and look at very specific population groups who have very highly specific and specialized needs and to be able to tailor solutions for them, but then to still be able to tailor solutions for them in low cost, localized and problem led ways. Um, one of the big things from, from my perspective that I think perhaps we, in hindsight, um, might have focused on more and certainly going forward are focusing on more and more is the impact of this, this issue on girls and women and the way that it has not just, as we said, been one of many problems that they deal with, but has really seeped into all the other problems that they deal with. Um, one of the examples, uh, again, a program I work very closely with, our Musahar program in Nepal, where we worked with 10,500 adolescent girls who are very highly marginalized, um, is that we've seen an enormous rise in the number of GBV-related cases, as we've seen in many parts of the world, but particularly insidious in these sorts of environments because the kind of support that they need is, is simply not widely available and really relies on organizations like us to make it available to them. Um, and it's been quite interesting. I think I'm, I'm Australian, um, my family's back in Australia. And so of course I've, I've kept a very close eye um, on, what's, on what's happening there. And the government has put in a lot of money into issues like mental health, psychosocial support, um, issues of domestic violence as a result of lockdown. And in the countries that we work in, those sorts of services simply just aren't there for us to be able to easily hook communities up with. We need to try to create them from scratch and create them in ways that they are scalable and sustainable and available and affordable to everybody that needs them. Um, and I think a, a potentially earlier focus on that, but certainly going forward, a very intensified focus on some of those issues will be huge. We have dealt with in this year an inordinate number of child marriage cases, rape cases, suicide cases amongst our beneficiary groups. Um, and so whilst we, we can talk about programming and pivoting programming, we are really talking about dealing with highly pernicious problems that need very, very, very intensive and immediate solutions to them. Otherwise it is literally a life or death matter for many of our beneficiaries. And I think I would love to see going forward that we are really able to take that focus to those who need it the most, those who really live on that edge of survival and that we're able to get there in time. I think Tom, I'll, I'll round up by saying this and pass back over to you or ideally to, to our audience for some, some questions. You started off by saying, it's all about in-time investment and I not only feel that very much from an organizational and programmatic perspective, but from a deeply personal perspective, when we've, we've heard these stories of girls or we've been working on these, these cases where we think if only we had X, she'd still be here today. Um, and, and that really kind of personal edge to it, I think is, is what's going to matter the most already does and, and definitely will going forward into next year. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, for, for me, um, 
you know, particularly in the, in that that period in the April to to June, we had this. Um, and again, it, it's not a regret, but it's just a constant reflection point about where we made the right decisions and, and balance. Um, I spoke about how you know, so on the one hand, we were really animated around um, around spreading the the prevention message. Um, um, so that people didn't catch COVID and 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 hand hand washing and and all the rest. And this was also the time when you know, the lockdowns were toughest, restrictions were were toughest, and and, and you know, a lot of communities were working. Um, you know, people living relatively hand to mouth um, day day to day in in in, in any case, um, and the levels of suffering were were, were extreme, and you. Know, it, these people were, were crying, crying out for for, you know, for for food in most cases, and um, that was part of part of the, the the package we brought in certain places. But whether, yeah, whether we got a, got the um, the balance right or not, um, I don't know. But it's, it's a reflection point, and um, yeah, that, that's one of the things that, that I'll continue to wonder about. As we look into, yeah, go on. I was just going to say, I mean, I mean, on that point, you know, our livelihoods work and particularly the family business work that we do will continue to be so critical next year. Yeah. I think this year we have really seen the fallout on the kind of protection and education and, of course, the kind of immediate survival um, uh, sorts of priorities, but going forward into next year, restoring livelihoods, helping <coughs> families get back on their feet, helping them support their children to stay in school will become a huge priority as we start to see markets shift and reopen. Um, and, and ideally we're in a good position to be able to support that with some of our approaches. No, indeed. And in, in 2015 and 2016, when we were supporting um, Sierra Leone and Liberia to recover from, from Ebola, um, our, our business support package um, was was the primary intervention um, and was, was so relevant. It was really in that time that we took it from from having success delivered a few hundred cases a year to 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 many to many, to many thousands, and showed that the um, the scheme could be replicated on on scale, and yeah, actually the next question is is, is what are you most looking forward to in in, in twenty twenty one? What part of our work, and um, and you, you basically took the words out of my lips for for that. Um, I, I think that will be the most. Um, relevant part of of of, of our armory next year and um we've the family business scheme um again really prior to 2020 we just had had housed in in west africa in the Sierra Leone where it began liberia <coughs> and we've developed some some strong proof in 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 nigeria in the last year or two and then i know over the course of of, of this year um we've expanded pilots in in rwanda in uganda um, in, in, in I think Mozambique are just lining it up, um, and I think it'd be very exciting to see um, the impact that we can make by spreading that very simple method um, of of helping families think of a, a, a business venture, gives them some basic um, some orientation, uh, and then injecting a, a small amount of capital into in, into that business and then supporting over a defined period which is the the essence of the scheme and really with a purpose of generating um enhanced income for the purpose of, of supporting the education of the of, of the children um again i give that recap for people on the call who, who aren't familiar with it um but simple stuff on scale which again is, is another course through, through our principle i think will be incredibly relevant next year um I mean, anything else next year which which you're particularly excited about? I mean, everything we've talked about, but I think more so than anything, it is the local partner-led approach um, and the ability to design solutions that are really close to communities because of those partner networks and really close to children. And then, of course, I'm mainly, over and above everything else, excited to help kids read, write, count, and learn more. Um, I think we have, as a global community, made immense progress in, in the education space, thinking about how to support children. 
And what I would hate to see is that COVID is a setback um, and that the school closures are a setback. As we said before, here is a window of opportunity to really redesign school systems, to really redesign the way we do learning to make it possible for every single child. And I, I hope that all the innovation and the thinking um, and the flexing that's come out of this year ultimately means more children have access to more learning um, and that we're all kind of going forward together to make that make that possible. No, I agree. And uh, one of my hopes is, is, is around potentially enhanced empathy around the, 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 the issue, the horror of, of, of children not in school, because it's, it's something which um, has gone from, from being extremely hypothetical for, um, for, for most of us living in the, um, yeah, the, 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 the Western world. Um, uh, I mean, if you said to me, the idea that my children might, might be out of school, but, you know, uh, in, in February, it would have just seemed, seemed nuts, but there we were in, 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 in April and May and June. Um, and and I think of how worried we were, and I still think of conversations we, we have at home about you know we're concerned that that, that so and so has, 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 has fallen behind, or you know they're not learning what they should. Wow, what if your child never had a school, or there was a school but the teacher wasn't equipped to to deliver any meaningful instruction, um, and on top of all the innovation that, 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 that has happened, I, I just hope that there's a sort of an outpouring of, um, yeah, my optimistic heart um, hopes that one of the, the silver linings of this is, is, an, is an outpouring of, um, of empathy with this issue. And uh, I, wow, well, like, as, as a global community, we, we can't let this happen to, to any child. Um, and if that was to be um, part of the, uh, the, the legacy of, of COVID, that would be a, um, a very positive silver lining. And, I think it falls on on agencies like like us, like Street Child, to to demonstrate the potentiality, to demonstrate the possibility. As you say, you know, you talk about last mile learning for a, a, a dollar a month. Even in the toughest situation, we can achieve something for children. Um, so you know, let's not say anything isn't isn't possible. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm inclined to sort of bring this to a to a wrap there from 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 my perspective. Um, uh, anything else you'd like to, to add, Ramya? Just to thank everyone who's on this yeah. call. I, I know we've got a lot of staff who've really been in the trenches with us. Um, and more than ever, I think one of the silver linings of this year has been bringing us closer, albeit on, on Teams or Zoom. Um, but, but yeah, it's, it's been very gratifying, I think, to work with a, a community of people who are really committed to keeping this show on the road, even whilst we're all dealing with quite a bit of complexity and change in our own lives um, and, and speaks to the kind of how compelling the problem is that we're all trying to solve. And of course, a huge thank you to our supporters. Uh, I really think when we come back to our ability to be problem led, to be agile, to, to get out there and rapidly respond, we are only able to do this because of the types of people who are on this call um, and who are ready to trust us to be able to pivot and do things very quickly. Um, and yeah, we remain really, really grateful to be able to do as much as we can with your investments um, and look forward to doing more next year. So very happy Christmas and a very, very happy new year to everybody who's um, still listening in. And yeah, we really look forward to working even more closely with you in the new year. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Amy, for, um, for yeah, your participation over the last um last hour and of course yeah you'll work throughout the the year everyone i just echo all of ramia's comments um street child is, is a uh, a community of, of is, is a mission aligned community from staff to supporters um to our, our different different myriad uh partnership relation partner relationships and um yeah i just want to thank everyone for um for their own contributions for everything we've made made happen this year and um of course you know going forward again we we roll together again and we can only achieve whatever we can achieve with the the contributions that the people make um in their different parts of the life of the organization um and so 
yeah, a, a massive thank you. Um, see you in in, in, in 2021. Um, and yeah, we do all look forward to a, a different um, and brighter 2021, um, whilst knowing it's not going to be the, the easiest either. Um, and yeah, just a very happy Christmas and, and, and happy new year. Thank you, everyone.